the highest tribute, their good marshal's life, leadership, and legacy. Written by Kekla Magoon. Illustrated by Laura Freeman. Thoroughgood Marshall was in second grade when he decided that if there was something he didn't like about the world, he should try to change it. He started with his own name. Thoroughgood, he decided. From now on, I will be known as Thoroughgood Marshall. There were many more things Thurgood wanted to change about his world. He grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, a segregated city. The law required black people and white people to use separate public facilities, such as restrooms and water fountains. Many stores and restaurants had whites-only signs. Theaters had separate seating areas, too. Thurgood observed big differences between the spaces for black people and white people. They were separate, but they were not equal. It was wrong, but it was the law, and one little black boy couldn't change it. Could he? Around the dinner table, Thurgood's father led discussions about important issues like segregation, his parents were determined to see their children break the boundaries the country's laws had set for them. If Thurgood was going to change anything, he had a lot of work ahead of him. But sometimes it was hard for him to believe it was worth trying. Thurgood's parents expected him to do well in school, but goofing around was much more fun. Sometimes he got a big trouble for misbehaving in class. One teacher assigned him to read the Constitution of the United States as punishment. The plan backfired. Thurgood loved learning about the law. The nation's constitution says all people are equal. So how can segregation laws treat people differently? Thurgood wondered. Thurgood joined the high school debate club. It was a good place to ask his questions and discuss solutions. He liked discovering facts that he could use to win an argument. He liked being part of a team. He liked using words and ideas to persuade people to see complicated issues in a new way. Segregation meant Thurgood had to attend a black college. So he went to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. First things first, he joined the debate team. Later, he met Vivian Buster Burry, who would soon become his wife. Buster encouraged Thurgood's dreams. Thurgood would become the first to do a lot of things that a black person had never done before. In the past, debate teams from black colleges only debated other black teams. Thurgood's team knew this was wrong. Could they change it? They could. In 1928, the Lincoln University debate team faced Pennsylvania State College in the first interracial debate between U.S. colleges. Thurgood wanted to become a lawyer, but his preferred school, the University of Maryland, did not admit black students. This was wrong. But it was the law, and he couldn't change it yet. Thurgood went to Howard University Law School in Washington, D.C., another black college. Professor Charles Hamilton Houston shared their goods belief that determined, educated people could do what was necessary to change unfair laws. Once again, their good became part of a team using words and ideas to affect the world. Their good studied harder than ever and graduated first in his class. As a young lawyer in Baltimore, he represented Donald Murray, a black man who wanted to attend the University of Maryland. The school's whites-only admission policy was wrong, and it was time to change it. Thurgood won the case, resulting in the nation's first court order to desegregate a school. This accomplishment was one step in a long-term plan to urge the courts to outlaw segregation everywhere. 
Thurgood gained a reputation for being an excellent attorney. He took on civil rights cases all across the country. He worked alongside Professor Houston, who became special counsel to the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, in New York. When Professor Houston retired, Thurgood took over his role as the lead attorney in the team of activists. Thurgood's most famous case was the pinnacle of his fight against school segregation. Black families in Topeka, Kansas wanted the Board of Education to allow their black children to attend the all-white school. The local court in Kansas said this was illegal. Thurgood appealed the decision to the United States Supreme Court, the highest court in the country. He presented his evidence, and in 1954, the court decided school segregation was unconstitutional. Thurgood had won the case. This victory rocked the nation. The nine Supreme Court justices made decisions that affected the law throughout the country. The case may have started in Kansas, but the decision would apply to school children in every U.S. state. Thurgood argued and won seven important cases before the Supreme Court. Each case was one piece of his plan to make the United States a fair and equal place for all people. His colleagues nicknamed him Mr. Civil Rights. Thurgood's wife Buster grew ill and died of cancer in 1955. He mourned the loss of his beloved partner who had always nurtured and encouraged him. He later married Cecilia Sissi Suyat, a Filipina woman 20 years younger than he was. No one minded the age difference, but interracial marriage was controversial at the time. Thurgood didn't care what people thought. He loved Sissy. They had two children together, Thurgood Jr. and John. His family was another team Thurgood enjoyed being part of. Sissy worked alongside him at the NAACP, and his sons would grow up to take jobs in public service working for justice in their own way. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy asked Thurgood to become a judge. Instead of arguing cases himself, other lawyers would argue cases in front of him, and he would get to decide. Thurgood accepted the job. He listened to over 100 court cases. None of his decisions was ever overturned by a higher court. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson promoted Thurgood to serve as Solicitor General. He would argue cases in the Supreme Court again, this time on behalf of the U.S. government. He was the first black person to hold such a high position. Thurgood won 14 more Supreme Court cases. He had argued and won more Supreme Court cases than any other attorney. Sissy and Thurgood celebrated good news on June 12, 1967, when the Supreme Court struck down the ban on interracial marriage. The wave of change was growing stronger. The very next day, President Johnson nominated Thurgood Marshall for a seat on the Supreme Court. Many people did not like the idea of a black Supreme Court justice. Thurgood had to appear before Congress for hearings. They asked him hard questions about the law to try to trick him. But after years of being a lawyer, Thurgood was used to facing pressure from powerful people. He stayed calm, and when he was finished speaking, Congress could not deny that he was qualified. Is there anything you can think of in your mind or in your disposition to prevent you from acting fairly, effectively, and efficiently with the United States government in this position? Not at all, sir. I believe that, oh, I'm certain that there's no possible reason that I could have to not adequately represent this government, which is, after all, my government, just as it is all of our government. Well, thank you, Judge Marshall. Thurgood Marshall was sworn into the United States Supreme Court on October 2, 1967. He was no longer a young black boy from Baltimore. 
limited by unjust laws. Now he was one of the people who made sure the laws were fair. As the first black member of the Supreme Court, Justice Marshall stood up for civil rights in the same way he did as an attorney. Among the nine justices, decisions were made not by one person, but by the group. All those years on his school debate teams and as part of a team of civil rights attorneys helped prepare Thurgood for the challenge of Supreme Court deliberations. Thurgood's ideas could not win every argument, but he was good at making his opinion heard. If he knew a law was wrong, he was in a stronger position than ever to help change it. Finally, something was right. Thurgood's presence on the court helped change his country's laws forever. Upon his retirement, Thurgood left all his private writings, notes, and journals to the Library of Congress for immediate public use, breaking the tradition of Supreme Court papers staying sealed for 50 years. If his ideas could continue to help create equality, he wanted them to be seen by scholars, law students, or anyone with a desire to peek behind the scenes of history. When he died at age 84, Thurgood Marshall was laid in state in the Supreme Court Rotunda, an honor given to only one other justice before him. The whole country knew and still knows through his lifetime of service to humanity their good marshal earned himself the highest tribute. But to those of us who know that struggle is far from over, history has another lesson. It tells us how deeply rooted habits of prejudice are, dominating the minds of men and all our institutions for three centuries. And it cautions us to continue to move forward lest we fall back.